I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. Top Gun was really a thrill. I must have done well in actual combat because at the time I was just a lieutenant junior grade, which is a, a first lieutenant in the Air Force. And so I may have been the very first lieutenant junior grade to go through Top Gun. That was the dream of a lifetime come true. I had wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot just like my dad from the time I was 10 years old. STS-27 was my, was my third launch and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. We were a top secret classified Department of Defense mission. So to this day, if I told you what we carried, you could never leave this hangar. Uh, you'd be... <laughs> well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm and Mike Mullane was my arm operator. So he moved the arm over there and we brought up the television image of the right wing. And I looked at what I was seeing and I said to myself, we are going to die. To be an airline pilot, there was mandatory age 60 retirement. I was a NASA astronaut until I was 50 years old. And so I looked at the situation and I had known a number of Southwest airline pilots. And they were just like me. They were flying because they loved to fly. There's a lot of piloting that goes into it, a tremendous amount of piloting that goes into it because you're going to wind up passing other airplanes. You're, you're going to get in a duel with another airplane that's fairly closely matched. So there's a ton of satisfaction from, from doing that. And hey, let's just talk about the racing itself. It's fun to fly low, but it's dangerous. And so the only time I fly low is at the Reno Air Races. But watching the ground go by you at 400 and 500 miles an hour is pretty darn thrilling because it's, it's really scooting on by. And that's fun. That's really fun. I had always been fascinated by racing planes uh, because they're sleek, streamlined, and they, they, they go real fast. There's that need for speed again, and they're raced around a pylon. And so I determined that I could break the existing altitude record for altitude and horizontal flight for that quarter category of airplane. And in fact, I did that in 1991. fond of saying that uh, 
If I have done well as an aviator, it's because my dad was the one who taught me how to fly. And he didn't just teach me how to fly, he taught me the why of it as well. He taught me the aerodynamics behind it, the reasons that you're doing things, not just, not just how to do it, but why you're doing it is, is also very important. The XB-42 Mixmaster was one of the most innovative American aircraft designs to come out of the Second World War. Douglas, the aircraft designer, took a completely fresh look at the needs of a bomber, one that could match the range of a B-29. If there was one word that epitomized the XB-42, it was efficiency. Its two engines drove separate air screws mounted at the very rear of the aircraft, leaving the fuselage and wings completely free of the usual drag element. The Mixmaster's crew consisted of just three men, eight less than the B-29, a pilot, a co-pilot gunner, and a bombardier. With a top speed that was 50 miles an hour faster than the B-29, defensive fire would only be needed if an attack came from the rear. Later, one of the prototypes was tested with supplementary jet power. Everything was done to maintain the XB-42's clean lines. Even the two gun barbettes were concealed when not in use, all done to ensure the smoothest, cleanest shape possible. The co-pilot, when he adopted the role of gunner, would rotate his seat to face rear and aim the twin sets of cannons by remote control. To maximize the gunner's vision, both the pilot and the gunner had separate cockpits. This unique feature may also have slightly improved the streamlining and given both men a better outward vision. But it made for very bad communications between the crew. What was more, General Hap Arnold disapproved of the bug-eyed layout, and a conventional canopy was soon adopted. However, not before the Mixmaster's big brother, the first Globemaster, had tried the same approach. The C-74 was a giant aircraft for any time, and its double canopy may have been an attempt to give both pilots a better view of what was going on outside. However, the idea wasn't around for very long, although the few C-74s that were made were still quite impressive, simply because of their sheer size. quickly evolved into the C-124 Globemaster, of which 448 were built, and some of those were still flying in 1974. Perhaps the last set of bug eyes to come along were on the North American P, later F, 82. Originally designed as a very long-range escort, by using common parts from the P-51. 
the twin Mustang would have protected US B-29 bombers on extra-long flights across the Pacific. The missions may have been so long that layback seats were considered for the twin Mustangs. The double fuselage did provide challenges for the designers at North American Aviation. And it also intrigued Army scientists at Wright-Patterson, because it presented a very different layout which might have unknown problems, both in aerodynamics and in terms of crew orientation. The P-82 was not exactly the same as a conventional twin-boom aircraft, like the P-38 Lightning, where the pilot is positioned right on the center line. In the P-82, whichever side was in control would always be off-center. There was also concern about the disconnect factor of having two pilots being completely separated. This was something the Army Aeromedicine team wanted to know more about. On the other hand, the twin Mustang concept could be put into the air quickly. Although in actual fact, the P-82 used surprisingly few parts from its P-51 cousin, something that was borne out by the price. The twin Mustangs cost four times the amount of a single P-51, although on one level, both aircraft were exactly the same, with each type taking just 90 days from drawing to prototype, and on both occasions, that was exactly what was needed. All told, 270 F-82s were built, with many serving as night fighters patrolling U.S. borders after the war, until the early jets arrived. As it happened, the twin Mustang's layout was not all that popular with pilots, perhaps confirming Hap Arnold's original instinct. What happened to the original XB-42 Mixmaster? It arrived just too late for war service. However, it did help to usher in the jet age, when one of the prototypes was converted completely to turbojet power, and became the XB-43, America's first jet bomber.